Okay, so yeah. Hi everyone, my name is Alexey and today we're going to talk about uh, modularization in Android apps, its benefits for the product and cases when you should use this and should not do that. And also we will discuss some common approaches. I will share a few slides from Google I.O. from 2019 about this topic and uh, my real experience in the current project. And uh, I would like to start with a general example to identify common problems in the monolithic projects. Like the most trivial case in Android development is uh, the next. Firstly, you fetch some data from the server, store, store it in the database, and then you draw some pretty UI, show the data to the user, and somewhere in between the sections, you perform some app logic to transform this data. And uh, given that the uh, typical Android app uh, might contain multiple components, including activities, fragments, services, and others, um, users often can interact uh, with multiple apps in a short period of time, and apps need to adopt different kinds of user-driven workflows and tasks. So um, I mean that you can end up in a mess when where activity makes um, Networks call business logic uses some databases and has strict dependency on uh, ORM libraries. So because of this, like Android specific, um, sometimes uh, people do not correctly separate all this stuff. And uh, yeah, this sounds like a general problem in this uh, in the development. And people already found a solution for this, like clean architecture or the architectural architectural approach from Google. And uh, if you haven't heard about it, please go and check it out as it's really important for the development. And uh, as a part of this presentation, I would like to highlight a few other problems with the monolithic approach. And the first one, it related uh, to the application size. It's like a bit mobile specific. So yeah, there is an analytics that says uh, for every six megabytes increase to an APK size, we have a decrease in the install conversion rate for a few percent. There are multiple reasons for this, like amount of data to download, uh, uh, the actual download time for the application, especially for users who have uh, who do not have a stable connection, so they may have uh, some connection issues. Also, the device storage, and actually, yeah, we have uh, a lot of budget devices who uh, which have uh, limited resources. And uh, how and why, uh, how and why it is uh, related to the monolithic approach. So yeah, all the code is stored inside the APK. Also, the resources are inside the APK with pictures for different screen resolutions, translations for different languages, native libraries for multiple devices, and so on. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's like a common problem, and uh, it's not necessarily to split up into the models to fix it. You can use Android app bundles to distribute your app, and uh, AAB it fixes uh, this problem with the resources. So the device gets like um, less uh, uses less storage to store your APK and to download it. And uh, yeah, it, now it's uh, obligatory to use this AAB when you upload new ap application to the Play Store. So if you are not uh, familiar with this, also please check it out. Uh, and um, yeah, AB partially fixes this problem, but still you have some features that people use uh, rarely or do not use at all. And also you may have some features that are available only in some specific regions, like uh, GDPR compliance related to the EU region, if I'm not mistaken. And splitting the app into modules gives you the flexibility on uh, how to build your features, how to test them, how to deliver them to your users. Yeah, monolithic app, it's not that bad. It, um, yeah, it has its uh, advantages like all code in one place that is uh, pretty readable and so on. But uh, let's check what other benefits we can have from, uh, from the models. Yeah, so the first solution, it's pretty simple. We do it when we use clean architecture. Uh, it's well known. So like application, model, UI, domain, and data. So I want to just quickly highlight uh, two benefits here. It's isolation and structure. So this approach gives you a possibility to isolate uh, classes on different layers from each other. And all code related to UI is a part of one module and business logic is in another module. So you can avoid mess with usage database or network calls in the UI and so on. Yeah, uh, your class is normal tied to the UI lifecycle and you can avoid some problems with activity recreation and other cases when the system like removes your app from the memory. Yeah, it's uh, pretty common for Android. Uh, yeah, we all know this clean architecture. And the next solution is um, to create a feature, uh, a model per feature. 
So um, the benefit is that your features are independent from each other. And if you develop new feature, you're confident that you do not break something existing. So yeah, and, uh, you don't need actually to retest all the app when you make some changes in a specific part. Um, yeah, another great thing here mentioned on the slide is on-demand delivery. Um, unique benefit of uh, feature mod models is the ability to customize uh, how and when different features of your app are downloaded onto devices. You have some limitations like Android 5 as minimal, but uh, it really helps you, like for example, to reduce the initial download size of your app and uh, later you can configure some certain features uh, to be downloaded as needed on demand or only by devices that support uh, certain capabilities like fingerprint, AR features, or even camera. Also with this feature approach, it's easier to run A-B tests, especially for big features if you introduce some new big dependency like third-party SDK or whatever. Yeah, you may deliver this feature to some limited amount of users and do not affect like the most of your customers. And also uh, a, a small like uh, benefit from this featured feature models that if you have multiple teams in your product working and developing the application, uh, they are not uh, interact with each other. So you do not have uh, merge conflicts uh, and you all, always have um, a strict ownership who developed that feature and you can find someone who can help you on it. But in uh, in the real world, uh, we use something like this. Like uh, we can get benefits from both of previous approaches, and uh, use this some kind of hybrid approach. So you can have uh, you can split your application by layers and by features, and uh, your code is also well structured. You have clear separation of concerns. You can use on demand delivery, the same benefits for testing. And also, the one thing that I want to mention here about testing is that um, you can easily use fakes, especially if your, like, your feature uses some data model. In a set, uh, like two features or three features use your data model in several places. You, your data model can provide some fake implementations. So you don't need to mock and stop it in every separate feature. Um, also, this approach gives you more benefits during the compilation. So you reduce your build time because Gradle can run parallel builds. Uh, Gradle may run some incremental builds and rebuild only a partial part of your application, like only what has changed. And uh, it, uh, in general, this approach works pretty well unless you realize you have a problem with the dependency tree. So in the real world, it uh, looks like this. Your models depend on other models and other models have more dependencies. So you need to rebuild almost all the app if you change something. Um, yeah, uh, so the, the problem with this uh, dependencies is that uh, you may build the dependency tree in the way where Gradle cannot run the parallel build and it will increase uh, the build time. It's, an, um, it's not a problem for a small application, but for a large, larger one, you may even be affected by the costs, especially if your CI plan depends on the build time. For example, we have the on B tries. And the question is, uh, do, we really, do we really need to use the whole, whole model just to access like one listener or two data classes. So in our team, we we come up with the next uh, solution. So we took the clean architecture as the beginning and we defined five types of models, like UI, domain, data, API, and shared. And uh, the first one is UI. So this model contains activities, fragments, presenters, view models, whatever you use for view patterns. And uh, we are trying to limit uh, Android dependencies only to this model, just to increase the build time as, and to do not depend on the platform itself. And uh, the second one is domain. It's similar to the clean architecture, some interactors, business logic, and other stuff. And um, the clean architecture also has this data layer, but we do not use database in the app. So we decided to appreciate this data model into two parts, API and data. API mostly used for retrofit and GraphQL services, so for networking. And data models contains only some details, pojos, listeners, and whatever you need to 
just store data and um, to navigate to other screens. So for us, the main advantage of having this data model separately is uh, that this data model doesn't have any dependencies and uh, we can uh, safely use it in other features and uh, we are sure that we won't have a deep uh, dependency tree. And uh, in our practice, sometimes this data model contains too much classes and uh, too many classes and listeners, and you do not need to all of them to simply open another screen. So we introduced uh, another model, we call it shared. It contains some high level um, listeners and callbacks and also navigation for classes. So it gives us more flexibility in terms of dependencies and also decreases our build time. And another trick that we did to save the time during the build is um, a dependency between UI, API, and domain layers. So in regular Android uh, clean architecture, we have like UI, domain, and data. They depend on each other. And in our case, we moved uh, API to be separate and uh, domain is now dependent on the API. This, this kind of uh, dependency inversion saved us 10% during the build. And uh, as for the tests, we increased the, them like for 40%. And uh, this happens because Gradle may uh, run more parallel builds for different components and uh, different API models at the same time. And also apart from this uh, five types, we use core models. For example, uh, all, fe uh, all features use activities, view models and other stuff. So we have some templates there, some common logic, and it is also shared across all the application. And uh, the great thing that uh, we have in Android is Gradle. It's a really powerful tool. And uh, we noticed that uh, some part of applications, they never change. So we decided them, uh, to move them to a separate uh, component. We call it common. We actually moved it out of the project and we created a separate library that is dis distributed as AR. And uh, we just apply it to our project. It um, saves us resources on during the development. So Android Studio is not that overloaded with a lot of modules. Um, that's pretty much it about our real practice experience and a uh, few words about the Gradle, as we already talked about uh, models. What are these models? So Gradle has a bunch of um, plugins and we use Android Gradle plugin. And it provides us a few, few model types, like application, Android library, Java or Kotlin library. These are the most common used in the apps. And uh, the yeah, application contains quoted resources, libraries, they contain shared code, and Android library also may contain resources, it's some common stuff. And another interesting thing here is a dynamic uh, feature. So this, uh, this model allows you to use delivery play, play feature delivery mechanics to download parts of your application uh, when user like uses your application you can download part of it uh, in real time uh, also you can remove part of an application for example you may have some tutorial or onboarding feature in the app and show it only on the first app start up but uh, during the like later when user uses your application, uh, this uh, feature is not executed, and but it's still stored in the device, and you can remove it from the device and free up some storage for the user. And it's uh, it looks really promising and great. Um, yeah, uh, we discussed the dependencies uh, about models. Also, a quick tip about Gradle that uh, we have two configurations to apply these dependencies, API and implementation. It's also some already old technologies we use here in Gradle, and it's pretty common. But uh, previously, I mentioned that uh, it's easier to create fakes and stops for testing. And uh, there is a Java plugin, actually Gradle plugin Java test fixtures. And it allows you to create your fakes like smartly. You can create test features that are commonly used to set up the code under test. So you can create some fakes or factories in the test configuration and then use classes as sources in other test configurations. So for example, if you have some class user, you can provide test user to other common 
uh, components in the test sources. And uh, yeah, you just need to apply this plugin and you'll have uh, another configuration available like test implementation with fixtures, uh, test, test fixtures implementation, or uh, you'll have to additional for API and implementation with the keyword with fixtures. And uh, currently this plugin is, it works only with Java or Kotlin libraries. Actually it has some problems in Android Studio with Kotlin libraries, but it works really well with Java. And uh, Google and JetBrains, they are working on the support of this plugin in uh, Kotlin and Android. And Google is going to release this uh, for Android libraries and it will be available in the upcoming release like 7.2. Yeah, we'll look into include it into our application because we uh, highly use this uh, fakes and stops across all the components. And uh, just uh, like a quick sum up about what uh, I already talked about. So do we really need to this uh, modularization? As a benefits, we have this separation of concerns, scalability. So your team can grow. You you won't you won't have uh, conflicts conflicting areas in the area so you can develop your product faster it also have this uh, dynamic delivery and uh, simplified testing easy experiments benefits that we already talked about and from the negative sides it's abstractions yeah abstractions they're great they give you flexibility uh yeah but they have their own pros and cons and uh, sometimes you may spend more time developing abstractions rather than delivering the feature. So for example, we have a small feature, uh, features, like we need to execute like five lines of code. And uh, to do that, you need to create three components and establish a few more dependencies. Uh, yeah, and the problem with uh, time and resources, uh, I want to share as a slide from Google IO. So this slide shows the dependency between cost and benefit. And it's uh, it's pretty hard to achieve 100% of modularization in the app. In a small project or in a small team, it is fine to stop uh, somewhere here. So you already get some benefits, but you do not invest uh, your time in, in something that uh, you won't use in the future. And in a big teams, like uh, if you have five teams or even maybe three teams, it is uh, good to invest more in this modularization. So you'll have uh, more flexibility in development and testing in the future. Yeah, so yeah, the main idea of the presentation is to make sure that you have a use case to use models and do not invest your time in something that uh, you do not use in the future. Yep. Your customers are the top priority. Does that's pretty much it from my side. I'm ready to discuss it if you have any questions. I guess no questions, right? No questions, just have comments that uh, we have modularity uh, architecture in our application, have the same architecture. And okay. it's, uh, and uh, I, uh, I uh, wanna say that we have uh, all of these benefits with testing and so on uh, that you have in this application. It's uh, ready, uh, ready for production. Uh, our code ready for production, and it. I, I wanna uh, add that it works. It works fine. In the practice, great. Thank you for presentation. Yeah, thank you for your comment. Yeah, I also used to use a monolithic uh, approach in in the SDK and. Uh, when I switch to this modular approach in the application, it, it gives you a lot of benefits. But uh, in my case, we have a lot of teams working on the one application. So we mostly use it for like scalability and other stuff that I discussed. Uh, let me share it actually, yeah. Uh, thanks for the presentation. I have a few questions. Uh, so definitely it will work well for the small applications and the application without any ecosystem like uh, like if some huge company have some SDK or something like that. 
but uh, let's imagine a case when we have a like common, uh, like for example, views that can be shared between the application, uh, between the different applications. And since like you had to share a whole UI model in that case, <clears throat> and probably it will create uh, some like huge dependency for it so just for use some like uh, button for example uh yes it is and we have this problem in our case so we have two applications and we have this uh, common model that we separated as ar library it has uh, common styles and uh, ui components that we use in both applications yeah it's not that optimal and uh, we are looking on how to improve that, but still we have this AR dependency and it saves us some efforts on developing new UIs. Uh, I can uh, have a suggestion, I guess. Uh, are you familiar with the architecture that are used by Kaspersky Lab? Uh, I'm not. Uh, they're using something like pretty similar, but they have like uh, separation by the feature models. Uh, for example, like hold this uh, slide, it's only for the one model. So something like that, right? So. Um, yeah, I guess it can be something like that. Uh, if you Google like uh, Kaspersky, some blog post on the Hubber Hubber, for example, so you definitely will find something. Yeah, thank you. I will take a look. Hey, uh, thank you for the presentation. I have one question. Uh, what about the situation where uh, one of your one or uh, some of your modules uh, have flavors? Uh, well, for instance, the uh, the API module can have uh, separate flavors uh, to use uh, different, uh, well, one of them uh, for some reason would use the GraphQL and the other one would use the REST endpoints. Uh, can your approach handle it? Well, that's an interesting question and uh, I don't have answer to this. We don't, like, we do not have multiple flavors in such cases. Yeah, we just created like a, one standard for our teams to use only retrofit or only GraphQL. So mostly they're just separated in different API models for us. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> they historically uh, uh, someone done this and uh, yeah, it, it can be hard to deal with it in the future, but uh, I just, just want to leave one comment that uh, we're using something like the hybrid approach in your next slide. And we have an issue with the common uh, module because it is shared between our project and uh, one more. And all the changes should be tested uh, uh, for our use cases and also for the other application use cases. And uh, uh, it's a lot of pain and inconvenience sometimes, but uh, I guess it can save some uh, time not to duplicate the work. So yeah, choose wisely yeah, for the common stuff. part. Yeah, and regarding your question about uh, multiple flavors, so most likely you can like introduce new interface and create multiple implementations per flavor, like for retrofit or GraphQL, and create some wrappers, like the first idea. Yeah, maybe maybe that can work. Some kind of uh, new adapter. Yeah. To include both cases. Okay. Okay, if there are no more questions,